Well, welcome to everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today's topic is getting the most from your learning and development budget. So why did we pick this topic for this month? Um, for companies that want to you know, be smart about their people management and HR, uh, to build high performance teams, attract talent, retain talent, and stay competitive compared to their competitors, um, leaders need to know how to upskill their employees and budgetary considerations are always a reality. So presenting today will be Randall Craig. For those who don't know him, I'll share that he's the founder of several successful startups. He's held a longtime position at a big four consulting firm. He was a senior executive at an American public company, author of eight books, and at, in the Speaker Hall of Fame, he's helped over 100 organizations scale, and he works with me at the Brain Trust Professional Institute, helping organizations uh, grow their businesses. So over to you, Randall. So we'll have Randall speak a little bit, and then we'll flip into some Q&A. I have lots of questions uh, on my own, and uh, we'll hear from you too. Over to you, Randall. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And wonderful. Thank you to everybody who's, who's watching live, as well as people who are um, uh, listening to the recording. Um, my, my opening remarks are going to be relatively brief today. And, and, and what I'd like to do is, is drill down very specifically on two questions. Number one is, is uh, does training actually generate results? Okay, and what are the results you're actually looking for? And the reason why I, I, I wanted to talk about this is because in a certain sense, I think we've forgotten as organizations, not-for-profits, associations, small businesses, large organizations, is that there's actually two kind of outputs from, from the training that actually happens. Number one is, um, you know, why invest in something unless you're going to use it to solve a particular problem? Right. And, and so, so fine, you could put somebody through some training and they will learn how to solve that particular problem, or at least they'll understand how to you know, approach it, perhaps. Um, and, and when they've done the training, there's a short term benefit that they can presumably take that learning back into the organization and, and the world will have changed. And, and of course, that's not exactly exactly what happens, but that's the theory. That's the short term benefit. But there's also a longer term benefit that sometimes we don't really think about. And, and that's what I wanted to address very briefly now before we sort of move on with the rest of the session. And, and that's that when people get the same underlying message and when people have a continuing, I don't want to say drip of training, but um, training that comes from here and comes from here and comes from here and comes from here and comes from here. And, from here, and it, it all sort of is, is speaking to the same thing. Um, there's a longer term impact, not just on the issue of retention and perhaps engagement, but also with respect to them understanding kind of how to actualize what the organization's um, actual purpose is. And, and, you know, almost every organization has got, you know, mission, vision, values, etc. But how do those actually get um, uh, imbued within everybody. And obviously it's the manager, obviously the senior leaders and everything. But I think that the uh, the training uh, can also have an impact. I'm not saying that if you're going to teach somebody, for example, how to develop greater business acumen, that that that, uh, that you spend all this time talking about mission, vision, values, and, and the, the organizational culture. But I'm saying that that over time, if you've got training that is keyed to having some of these things as an underlying um, um, a foundation, if you will, that over time, people will start to imbue it and say, aha, I see how it fits together. And I can almost link some of these higher kind of things to the specific things while still accomplishing the short term goal of teaching people specific things. The second point I want to make before um, before we, we, we move into the Q&A session is, is that training in a certain sense can be a very solo activity. So for example, for me, I want to learn how to do this particular task, okay? I can go outside and do it. I could do it internally. I could do it uh, uh, on my own. I could do it within the context of the organization. There's pros and cons of all of those we, that we can get into if you like. But fundamentally, training is not just an individual activity. It's actually a team activity. And for two reasons. Number one is that when the training happens as a team, people ask different questions. And that helps activate um, the, uh, the, the um, understanding of that particular concept with the other learners who are actually there, number one. Number two, when everybody goes back to their day job, and I'm sure for, for, for some of you who are on this, this call or, or listening in, you're probably thinking that, yeah, I've been there where I've gone to training, I've gone to a three-day conference, I've gone to that one hour, you know, self-pacing, whatever it is. Then you get back into the real world of your of, of your deadlines and your jobs and your pressures and 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 so many things that are going on that what happens? 
that training doesn't stick. And by the way, because everybody else is giving you different pressures, those new words, that vocabulary that you've learned while you've done this specialized training just by yourself, no one understands because they haven't actually been part of it. So there's, there, there's a group dynamic that sometimes you can put into place if you're looking to change an organization. Um, excuse me. Uh, this is one of the ways of doing it so that everybody builds a common background. Everyone builds a common vocabulary. Everyone has as uh, as um, it's possible to have self, you know, uh, supporting uh, team dynamic once you're back in the office. Because when people see others using that knowledge in a certain way, or when somebody asks for help, it becomes a little bit easier. The idea of taking the training out of the the training room, if you will, real or virtual, and putting it and and saying, okay, now we can make a difference as a team, as an organization. That that's something else. So. Um, I'm just looking, are there any other quick, oh, yes, um, I'll mention one other thing, then we'll go on for questions. I don't mean to say one other thing over and over and over again, but the question of ROI and, and how do we get some sort of return on investment for the training? Oh, man, I, I don't mean to do a bit of a slap slap to, 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 to leaders, but sometimes for some leaders and some managers, it's well, you know something, um, I want to put somebody through training. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a tick the box exercise that somebody goes to training or a staff member says, I think I need to learn more about tick box, et cetera. And, and, and fine, off they go to training. But where's the connection to actually um, making a difference when you're going, when you're going to uh, come back? And, you know, some companies say, well, you know, we'll, we'll send you on this training. Okay. Maybe it's an MBA, and and gee, if you get seventy five percent on everything, we're going to uh, pay fifty percent or whatever it happens to be. Some some large organizations do that, and that way there's skin in the game. And if they don't do so well, well, you're not going to pay for it. But um, others, on the other hand, will say, well, you know what, we're going to put everybody through such, or put this one person through this particular training or coaching, for that matter. It's the same kind of argument, and and there's no metrics as to uh, as to what's going to change after. So there's no conversation to say to that particular employee or group of employees, we're going to invest in you because you're important. But when we come back, uh, let's talk about what's going to be different. Because the purpose of the training is something very specific, okay, uh, when it is specific. Um, other kinds of training is a little bit different. Uh, 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 an individual contributor is going to become a manager. You might want to send them for training or have them learn a little bit more about um, about the the, uh, the job of management, okay? Or um, the general, you know, somebody's got a functional knowledge, but they're promoted and now they need wider knowledge, uh, something to help them with their business acumen. Or maybe you want to bring everybody in the organization up or critical thinking skills. But the question is, what's going to change afterwards? And to have the conversation before the commitment to training is actually being made. Because that suddenly uh, changes the learner's mindset within the training itself. It's like, okay, I better pay attention because there's an expectation when I get back to uh, the office that I'm going to, there's going to be a change. There's going to be an intervention here, the training, and there's going to be a change afterwards, right? And then afterwards, obviously, a little bit of a conversation, which was, what did you learn? Okay, how's it going to make a difference? What support do you need to make sure that that difference actually happens? Okay, said another way, how do we get this ROI from this investment that we've made in you that we thought you were worth it to do, right? So, so that's, that's the, the third point uh, before we open to questions. And uh, um, let me pass it back to Rania. Of course, Randall, thank you. If anybody wants to come on mic and put your hand up and ask a question or put it in the chat, I'm happy to read out loud. Um, I'll get <clears> it started while you guys uh, think. Um, so it's not a secret, Randall, that many organizations, uh, large organizations, respected organizations, you know, are not offering the training that they used to. Um, and perhaps they're thinking, you know, our company's doing well. Uh, we don't need to fix something that's not broken. Uh, perhaps they're thinking, you know, we've encountered this. You hear this, that they don't think the money is worth it. They don't think it's worth the squeeze. You invest in people. And like the examples you said, how do they really benefit? Where's the ROI? And am I just training my employee to be more desirable for whatever future employer is going to poach them? So, you know, what, when we know that training is important for many reasons in an organization, um, what would you answer to this sort of line of thinking that it's not necessary or I'm sort of opening myself up to overqualifying my employees? 
And is there any sort of insurance policy you would recommend to leaders to retain that learning within an organization? Yeah. So very for, first of first of all, I would say that uh, that um, our basic assumption uh, for everybody right now here is is that that it is necessary. And I want to play devil's advocate for a moment and 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 replay some conversations that I've had with with uh, with senior leaders to, who say, well, no, no, thank you. It's not. And this is a very strategic decision that some leaders and companies will make to say, you know something, we hire people who are already baked, who need to deliver, and once they stop delivering, we're going to fire them and we're going to bring somebody else in who can do the job. Very often in sales organizations, you find that. They haven't met their quota, out you go, we'll find somebody else who can. And we're not going to invest in you because we want you to be knocking on doors and making pitches and cold calling and building relationships and everything like that. And if you can't do that, out you go. We're not going to train you. You should know this stuff. As in a certain sense, you know, and there's a lot of companies, particularly, you know, as the economy has sort of gone up and down a little bit, there's a number of companies who've actually had that attitude. And, and for them, I guess it works. It doesn't exactly um, build loyalty, you know, a bit of culture of fear is sometimes not the greatest, but it is a strategy that some use. Uh, in a certain sense, they're they're um, um, leeching off of earlier investments that other people have made in those sales execs. Just as since we're talking about that, but but it is a strategy. Um, I don't particularly believe in it because I I think that when uh, an employer does invest in in their people, uh, the, the 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 staff the team recognizes it. In terms of getting the most value out of it, I, I think uh, I touched on it a little bit before, and maybe I'll expand on it, is, is what's the team dynamic? Is the team learning together? Is it aligned so that when people go back to the office, it's more likely that you're going to have a self-supporting um, uh, kind of thing where you can actually have a meeting as a team, say three weeks later, a month later, saying, let's, let, let's do a lunch and learn now. And let's actually... Um, uh, let, let's actually review what we had there. Are we actually implementing this? Are we not implementing this? In one of our uh, in one of our programs, um, um, we would do a training, for example, an hour and a half with a particular group. And then what we do is uh, two weeks and four weeks later, we'll actually come in and do activation meetings with with the individuals or groups, et cetera. And and that way, it sort of forces it. It's not a it's not like a a one and done, if you will. And and so you know whether it's us coming in and doing individual activation meetings or whether it's a manager who's, who's saying, let's just get together and we're going to have a, a, a guided conversation on this and see what it is that, that now that we've had a little bit of time for it to sit, we can actually surface again and, and actually do it. That, that, that's, that's also possible. You know, as long as the manager was in the trainings, they kind of know what was going on there. So that's, uh, that's how I would answer it at, at a certain level. Niklaus, got that little Zoom hand up. Over to you. Um, thanks for that. Um, so one comment and maybe a couple of questions, if I can. Yeah. Um, first, for, for a comment, I really appreciate you emphasizing the need to identify kind of goals and behavior change in advance of training. I've, um, it's such a simple concept, especially from like a measurement perspective and like a a behavior management kind of perspective, but one that I think gets overlooked, including by myself and other folks within my agency. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Your question, did you did you have a, a quite you said a comment and a question was yes. Uh, two two questions actually, if I can. So yeah. the first question was about um the different resources for training. If you can comment on, you know, what's the most efficient or what's the most effective, because I've seen uh, a number of different approaches and I'm not sure which ones are the best impact and it might be very situational and that's fair. So I'd appreciate hearing, you know, what situations you are aware of that lend themselves better to one training methodology or another, but things like getting an external consultant coming in with those, uh, kind of degree of expertise for training or having an internal resource that is dedicated to training or perhaps having a train the trainer model. Like, is there, do you have any perspective on <laughs> which of those is most effective in what kind of situations just for yeah. um, picking and choosing how we solve a, a perceived training need? Okay, uh, that's a really good question. And and good thing we've got like seven hours for us to talk about it because 
because there's so many different ways of doing it. Uh, but let, let me sort of boil it down to, to maybe some news you can use. Um, it depends on a couple of things. Like one of the things that, that is kind of interesting is if you pour, if you throw a lot of stuff on the barn wall, okay, uh, some of it is going to stick. And, and, you know, some people, for example, um, you know, leaders, you know, uh, you know, CEOs, you know, C-level, you know, executive director, those types of people are exceptionally busy. And to have them sit down for a self-paced course is not likely going to be something that they have the time to do. And if they do, they'll scan it very quickly and they're not actually going to, most of them won't, won't sort of deal into it. On the other hand, for that kind of level, uh, you know, to tell you the truth, coaching, the right kind of coaching might be the very best kind of training you can do because um, that deals with that person's specific gaps and knowledge, et cetera. You know, at the, at the, at the, at the, call it the management level, if you will, I think it depends on what are some of the priorities of the organization and the gaps with various individuals. It's kind of like a, you know, almost a Venn diagram. Because if you have, if you put people through training where they understand that it's for the company, but they have no personal interest, whether it's the mode of delivery or the particular topic or, 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 or whatever, it's not as likely that they're going to embed that into their um, post-training behaviors. And, and the retention is going to be somewhat lessened as well. For those times, like, for example, in organizations where there's, say, compliance training, okay, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that you probably want to do is you want to make sure that, that when it comes to the performance appraisal, that there are certain things in there that are tick must be done for the following reasons, right? Um, I've seen, on not we're not in the compliance training business, just, just so you know, but I, I've seen compliance training that is stultifyingly boring, delivered by people that should not be delivering training because they're uninteresting, right? And they don't use some of the most basic training um, uh, techniques like storytelling or interactivity or experiential or a whole bunch of other things. And therefore, you know that tick the box, the, the training is done, but there's going to be no retention, let alone behavior change. So, so um, that's kind of a little bit of an overview. I think that there's a place for for, for self-paced training. So, you know, we, we offer a whole bunch of, you know, like eight courses that, that, that is all self-paced, for example. Those are for some very specific knowledge creation. Okay, and 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 um, uh, gap filling. Okay, so so that's one kind of thing. Uh, another, for example, is where you say, okay, you know something, we need some sort of group behavior change. We need to have everybody. So, for example, we've gone into an agency where where the challenge was everybody was really really good in their particular narrow area, but most people did not have an understanding of general business acumen, let alone critical thinking, and asking great questions. So we went in and, and we sort of did that kind of thing. And everybody in the entire organization went through this, okay? Even the, the, the senior managers. Um, why? Because everyone had to be on, on, on the same, same page. Um, on the other hand, excuse me, on, on the other hand, um, there is a, a, a place for, um, I, I, it's such an awful word, I'm going to call it drip content. You know, if we take from some of the professionals, uh, the, the concept of CPD, continuous professional development, the question is, how do we in, 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 in uh, you know, non-regulated professions, how do we make sure, how can we learn from that? And so one way is to say, well, you know what, why don't we see about having a, um, a webinar every month and whoever is free can attend there. And over time, the, 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 the knowledge of the organization will change, will, will, will grow and people will pick up some particular things, et cetera. And that sort of left you with the, okay, let's do lots and lots of organizing, of finding various presenters and all this kind of stuff coming from here. You know, it's a higgledy biggledy approach where, where everybody's talking about stuff and there's no connection. Okay, to 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 the underlying foundation and priorities of the organization because you got a million different people. So in in our particular case, we found that that okay, so fine, we we've got what you know seventy plus different monthly things, and and uh, the trick isn't to get people to choose to come, okay, but it's to have them understand that that actually not understand have them see by experiencing that this is actually valuable to them. There's some degree of interaction and everything. 
And and this is this is the turning point difference, I think, that makes a difference. If you just do a webinar, fine. After the webinar, everyone's going to go back to their job. They'll never do anything. But what if that that every week you had a little, you know, micro learning tidbit, three or four paragraphs that you're able to send to people that key off of that learning so that it would bring recall and it'll also activate some of the knowledge so that it you have the chance of it actually, you know. And so so the, the idea of, of being a little bit more uh, strategic with respect to how those training dollars are spent, um, you know, it makes it a little bit easier to, um, to, to, to do that. Um, I think there's also uh, two other modalities of training that, that sometimes you don't really think about, but I, I, I'd like to message, uh, mention. One is, is uh, you know, some organizations will have um, all hands or all members or, or uh, you know, uh, annual kickoffs or whatever it is, or an annual conference, et cetera. There's a role for, for, for the keynote, okay, where the keynote sets the tone. And, and, and for, you know, for me, uh, I, I'm in the you know, Speaking Hall of Fame, so, so I, I, I do this stuff too. And what I will say is I've got a, a whole ton of professional speaking colleagues. It'll do wonderful keynotes. But the question is, how do you make sure that what's delivered from the keynote is also delivered through the self-paced courses or through that monthly team training, the CPD, or through um, uh, in-person courses, et cetera, as opposed to rah, 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 and then what's the connection other than a very light duty one, right? Um, so so that, that the, the keynotes, that's one particular area. And the, and the final other one is, is this, um, the question of, of, of bringing an outside facilitator, say for retreats. So whether it's a management group, for example, or a particular uh, department, or whether it's a brainstorming to say, okay, if, for example, we're going to get the, the, the leader, the VP, the, the executive director, whoever it is, to actually run the retreat, uh, and there's a difference between facilitation where you're pulling stuff out as opposed to um, training where you're trying to push stuff in, if you will. But the one thing that, that, that is common is that if you actually have somebody internally who's actually delivering that, that means delivering the facilitation. It's very, very hard to also participate yourself. And when you take the most senior person out of the participation, um, you lose the, the, the benefit of all their experience and their knowledge. So the idea of saying, okay, if we're going to do a retreat, let's just say, yes, you can get an external facilitator, but are you able to get an external facilitator who actually can run a session themselves to do some of the training? Because that'll be aligned as well. Um, what uh, Nicholas, I, I always worries me when when I'm doing more talking than than, than listening. Okay, the, the short version is is it depends, right? Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the organization. It depends on kind of where it fits in. It depends on the philosophy of of, of investment that you want to do. Um, it also depends on the type of of change and movement of behavior that, that you're trying to do? Is it post-merger and you want to do something? Is it something in the public sphere where if you're able to activate every single arm and leg in the organization, you can make a greater contribution to your purpose? Is it a question of how do we reduce risk? Uh, is it how do we improve customer, clients, member service, whatever it happens to be, right? And sometimes things are, are good. I will say with COVID, Sorry, I'm just on a rant here, uh, but <laughs> I, I will say with COVID, okay, all of a sudden people have recognized that some things, excuse me, can actually be done virtually, okay. But I also think that even though you know we've got a you know, we've got a studio, you're not looking at it right now behind me, but we, we've got like a virtual studio. We can do we could do virtual, but I think a lot of people are kind of tired of that. You know, they're tired of Zoom. And 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 sometimes if you want to do a little bit more experiential learning, it's a lot easier to do that in person, right? So we've got clients that want both, right? So uh, it really depends. Nicholas, is that is that sort of? Um... Yeah, I think uh, I think you did a, a good job of um, you know highlighting and identify some different modalities and some of the strengths associated with them, and um, it at least gives me some added confidence and understanding them like when to apply that versus another one kind of thing right and it'll give me the tools or the language to challenge 
the perspective because like you know just last week i had another leader in our agency say oh we should create basically this drip content kind of approach and my gut instinct was that's so wasteful like it's not targeted kind of thing and i i'm hearing a little bit of that but i'm also hearing that it can be beneficial if we pair it nicely it's kind of like a wine and cheese kind of approach where we're, we're trying to kind of make those connections between things and it can be the same topic or same topics but just with different targeted outcomes uh related to them whether it's behavior change or knowledge of the broader group or you know whatever the, we're, we're kind of going for that sense so so let me let me let me actually give you some very very specific uh examples of wine and cheese Okay, um, because sometimes there's a charcuterie board with all kinds of other things on there too. You know, we, since we really love these metaphors and everything, thank you. Um, so, so let's just say we're doing this monthly drip training. Okay, uh, it's it's one it's it's one hour. There's like forty minutes of, of 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 webinar and twenty minutes of conversation discussion, much like we're doing on on this particular session. Okay, although more questions, right, from everybody. So we're having that and and then finally get something every single week and, and that's a different sort of addition to it. Okay, but that's the wine, okay? The cheese might be, say I'm coaching uh, the, the CEO or, or some of the partners, okay? And so from the, the, the monthly thing, it's easier to feed back up stuff to that leader that in that coaching session that they might not have been able to hear because of, Sometimes no one that tells the boss anything. Same thing when those monthly things are actually delivered. Okay, guess what? If I understand that such and such is a big issue, okay, this month, next couple of months, that gets embedded into the messaging of what happens monthly. Okay, let me give you. Um, let, let me add something else to the to, to the wine and cheese. Um, let's just say we're we're doing. Um, we've got something called MBA in a day. Okay, meant for to to move the business acumen up for everybody. Well, guess what? Don't you think that uh, spending time um, with people monthly will mean a far more focused and relevant MBA in a day training for everybody than if I just sort of said, okay, yeah, we'll do a MBA in a day. And then I, you know, we spend a, a couple hours customizing it, et cetera. Oh my God. If I've actually heard from all these people, um, if we've heard from all these people when we're doing these monthly things about this issue, that issue, that, that would become a far better way to provide examples during that, you know, in-person MBA in a day training. Okay. And by the way, um, in the MBA in a tr day training, when there's concepts that are a little bit harder for the people, okay. Or for example, when, if, if I'm doing, you know, critical thinking skills training at the same time, and I see there's a couple of people that are just absolutely superb, uh, superb. If I'm coaching the CEO, it becomes easy to say, you know something, there's some interesting high potential people that I've met in the organization. Um, and they would typically say, uh, yeah, actually, so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and I would say, take a look at this person and this person. Those people seem pretty sharp. I was pretty impressed. And and so, so it doesn't matter how much is in the wine and cheese, all the different varieties of wine and cheese. But sometimes... You're able to, if you if you line the stars up a particular way, you can get synergistic effects that are far greater than the particular rationale for doing you know point training, right? And I think that 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 is 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 a very strategic way to look at learning and development, and also frankly running the organization than just saying we're going to put people in a training of such we're going to get somebody to do a webinar whoa we're going to get a keynote from for this we're oh, we're going to give somebody coach like and when it's connected you can get something that's actually very interesting so nicholas i'm loving watching your eyes move and the chin scratch and the nodding i'm going to put in the chat here um randall's link to meet if any of this is uh you know, gelling for you. If you want to follow up with him, you can uh, continue. I welcome more conversation uh, questions for the rest of the hour. Valérie, am I saying your name properly? Uh, yeah, I go by Valerie too. Yes. Hey, Valerie, <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, oh, yeah, it was only my mom who called me Valérie. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I don't have any specific questions just to learn. I mean, we do have we're very small, um, not-for-profit uh, membership as a national membership association. 
um, with, you know, we budget for training for individuals uh, as well as group trainings um, and then some more team building, an annual event kind of thing. Um, and it's just, we've recently expanded our management side. We're management heavy at this point. We have more managers, more people in management than non-management. Uh, they're a newish team. So I'm looking, I'm trying to think of what would be a great way, what would be a good topic to start with on this new team coming together in management. And I know, um, yes, Randall there, you mentioned uh, critical thinking. Um, is that like a great, like, I, I, I don't know, I'm just like trying to think of, uh, just get recommendations on so, on, um, yeah, good topics, uh, starter topics for. So, so what I would yeah. say, what what I would say is this: um, a dimension of training. I'm so glad you asked the question. A dimension of training that we haven't really talked about is the mechanism of using training itself to help a team gel. You know, mm -hmm. oftentimes it's you do this at a retreat or you do this, you know, whatever. You know, you give people a really big project to work on and everything, and and I think that this is. Uh, um, th this is this is the perfect thing for for getting a newer team to gel, uh, and, and that's critical thinking. And the reason why is you know it's it's critical thinking is not just hey just ask why 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 a bunch of times, but it's how do you actually get people to be thinking in a particular way. Um, and and um, I will say you know because so much of our training is not a, a, a one and done kind of thing, the best kind of the best kind of uh, critical thinking training that you can do, which which is the kind of you know, we like to do, is is we give people an assignment to work on beforehand, and so they work on an assignment beforehand. Okay, as part of the critical thinking training time. Okay, they present the it and they 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 get feedback from other people, and other people you know, use critical thinking to point issues with respect to it, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a whole bunch of experiential stuff that they're actually going through. So it's not death by PowerPoint, which is like awful, um, excuse me, awful, uh, but it's actually getting them to do things. You know, For example, one of the things that, that, that's uh, very exciting, um, at least for me, is, is, is uh, mock case interviews. And, and the way these things work is you present a particular person as if they were a consultant dealing with member, for example, or whatever. Here's a situation. And it's not something that they would typically deal with every day. It forces them to think about how to solve problems in a different way. And so if you imagine, you know, uh, there's an interviewer and an interviewee, that's, a, for example, me and, and one of the participants. And then there's the audience of everybody else, whether it's, uh, you know, eight people or, or 30 people, whatever the number is. And in a certain sense, you know, you're 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 going back and forth, etc. Meanwhile, as the as the interviewer facilitator, I'm asking the audience, okay, what did you think of this? Is there another way you could ask this question? What do you think of this? So the audience isn't off the hook, okay? But but one person gets a chance to sort of almost you know I don't want to say put me in the hot seat, but put me in the hot seat, and they could be the hero. Right. But meanwhile, they're thinking, oh, I never thought of asking this this way or I never thought of connecting the dots that way. In this particular critical thinking training, just as it, just to finish the loop on that one, what we do after that is we say, OK, well, the work product that came from your from the feedback that you got during the session, which you worked on as a team beforehand. Thank you very much. Um, you now have to present it to the senior leadership or the board of the organization that you're part of. Right, and the idea is is that that becomes part of your IP that will actually help the organization go forward. It's not a stupid training exercise. It's something that hopefully will will move the thing forward. The key points of this is that it's not show up, be fed, leave, don't remember. Right, there's stuff to do beforehand. There's there's a very experiential, fun stuff to do. Okay, that that sort of makes it real and personal and everything and and everything. And then afterwards, there's some stuff to do as well, right? And, and um, you know, for critical thinking, particularly, just since we're talking about that, you cannot do it any other way. You know, how do you get people to ask questions or think outside the box, right? How do you get people, for example, and by the way, while that might be the vector, working together as a team is the output. 
Okay, and so critical thinking and working together with, with a newer team, or for example, we've seen it where there's been people from for larger organizations from different departments who don't really know other people and we want to wire them together. So that becomes the secondary kind of output as well. Um, if I could add to this, Randall and Valérie, uh, when I hear uh, Valérie talking about, you know, lots of managers, more managers than uh, people or projects to manage, um, you know, there's lots of chefs in the kitchen. Um, some of the important topics that come to mind for me that we deal with with our clients are issues around alignment, like aligning the team in the right direction and communication. So I think a lot of it boils down to expectations and culture, but maybe Randall, do you see that also as important? The yeah, I, I I do think it is. I I, I do think it is um, because um, and and let me let me take my God, what a great question. If you've got um, on a smaller A alignment sort of front, you have everybody going through something that aligns them because they build the vocabulary. They're all going the same direction, right? And that's very very. Like that's important because that, that way it builds reten you know, retention and, and and common experience and all those kinds of things. But there's also the bigger alignment, the bigger A alignment, which is, okay, if leadership is saying this, okay, if that monthly drip professional development is saying this, if that well, critical thinking training, since we we're talking about that, is saying this, if a self-paced course is saying this, and they're all aligned, there's this that synergistic effect where people say, this is the way the world should be. This is what the priorities should be. This is how we land the strategy airplane. It's not you know, getting different messages in from all these different modalities. It's everything aligned. And I think that that makes it a little bit easier because you know, I can guarantee if I put somebody into a room for live training and then put a, a whole group of people, some people they'll, they'll really take to it and some people not as much. Other people, you put them in, if you put that same group in front of self-based training, okay, there's a whole bunch of people that will get it and will get a lot of value out of it, but there'll be one or two people that it doesn't exactly work. If you have a keynote, there's a whole group of people out there, a whole bunch of people will get it. And there's a couple of people that won't. Everyone's an individual. And so if you're able to provide the same message through these different modalities, all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier for, for everybody to get on the same page. And that's where you get some of that alignment. Okay. Uh, beyond just the benefit of getting everyone aligned because they're taking a particular course at a particular piece of time, you know, so hopefully that answers the question. Valérie, was that helpful? Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question, Randall. We talked about courses, training, retreats, you know, all kinds of uh, different modalities or uh, ways to train. Uh, but what about the opportunity to spend time with senior people? So, you know, whether it's, you know, junior lawyers following senior lawyers or doctors, I mean, all kinds of uh, fields use this sort of practice. Um, is this spending time with senior people when organizations think about their budget and how they want to use staff time, does that check a box? Does that like, can that replace like the functional skills training or team training? Like where does management giving of themselves or leadership giving of themselves fit into the mix? So uh, I think that's critical. You know, sometimes organizations, bigger ones will say, we're going to have a formal mentorship program. And that's how we're going to translate Okay, sort of some of the knowledge, behaviors, uh, philosophy and everything. And and the, you know, the things that you don't usually get. I think that's really important. Some organizations say, well, let's let's take a look at some of our high potential ones and we'll we'll pluck those and pair them with um, somebody who's a little bit more senior. Okay, and, and they'll have a relationship for a period of time. And then the, the secondment, if you will, ends and, and that's the way it goes. Some organizations have uh, what's called skip manager meetings where where uh, a leader will meet, uh, a person will meet their manager's manager once a year just for a, a or twice a year for for just a, a check-in and, and a conversation, et cetera. Um, some, some organizations will say, you know what? Um, and hopefully most of them say this, the part of the manager, you know, this isn't 1940s command and control world. Um, it's not a question of being 
the authoritarian manager who makes you know people work, 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 work. But hopefully nowadays managers are a little bit more uh, supportive in terms of recognizing the individual requirements that each individual person that reports to them needs in order to get them working the best. And and it's and and there's there's that sort of angle where that mentorship, if you will, um, sort of comes along with the job of actually being a manager. Right, rather than just being, a, say, an authoritarian style management from 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 years gone by. So, so I, I think that all those are part of it, but there's a real risk, and here it is. Too often, what gets modeled might not be new ideas and 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 new behaviors and new ways of thinking and other perspectives, and and as a result, what gets imprinted sometimes is not new things okay old ways of going about you know you know if things were were working well etc you know it'd be great but not every manager is perfect not every senior person is perfect so therefore the question is where does that external stimulus come from right and the leadership fine coaching okay you know the the, the middle tier management training and some particular functional skills etc you know specific people yeah it could be self-paced courses okay yes it could be um the, the monthly CPD kind of thing, right? And and so I, I think that that so long as you're feeding new information to the individuals in a line kind of way, okay, they're going to be able to, I guess, uh, amplify the impact of, of those internal mentoring kind of relationships. So for example, if, if you're mentoring somebody as a leader, and they and and the person that that you're mentoring says, you know, I was recently on a training or I attended, you know, the monthly CPD or something, and and they talked about say building an agile organization, or serving our members, you know, or changing our business model, blah 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 blah. And I just wanted to talk about what that might mean. I hadn't thought of that before. Hmm, all of a sudden, there's a different kind of conversation that takes place in the mentorship kind of thing if it's with a senior person. Okay, if it's the, with the person's manager, once again, it's like more ingredients into the mix where that, that that focus on the topic of whatever the objective of the day is, right? So I think getting the, the some of that outside perspective is is uh, is 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 worthwhile, and and um, otherwise, the best you can do is what you just happen to have on the team, and that's it. And for organizations that serve members or large client bases, et cetera, the question also is, gee, if you're doing something for uh, Valérie, uh, your members, let's just say, is there any way that you can sort of glom onto that for the staff? And it's an interesting concept. You know, I've, I've spoken at many conferences where I, I, I say to the client, you know, I spend so much time learning about the organization and doing research in the industry and, and, and the history of the organization and the issues, et cetera, et cetera. It's just so I can deliver this keynote. You know, if your staff is at the annual conference anyway, because they're putting it on, why don't we take a half day and we can do a session on fill in the blank just for the staff, okay? Even if it wasn't what I'm talking about on the stage, but the research is done already. So why not take advantage of it, whatever it happens to be? So, so sometimes... Uh, there's those kinds of opportunities that you don't always see, uh, but are, are 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 available if you ask, because the work's mostly been done already. So the cost is is not uh, is not like doing it fresh. So, good yeah. question, Rania. Um, I have a question. You know, we have uh, people. Many people change is hard, and the idea of getting new training and changing things. We've definitely had uh, you know clients where part of their team reflects that voice. And then you have other people who are chomping on the bit for change and want to learn and they're really keen about it. Let's say in their situation where the management leadership picks the topics for training to roll out and the team is like uh, very resist, like they're not interested in these topics. Is that sort of a signal of like a misalignment where management is not understanding the needs of the team? So I've seen this in organizations where there's been a merger, for example. And the manage the, the senior managers don't actually really understand kind of some of the details of the company that was acquired, right? The the the, the culture might be a little bit different. The uh, um, the, the skill base might not be fully known. Why do I need to take this training? We we just did that six months ago. Or gee, you know something. This is our 
deep expertise. Why do we need to take training? So, so sometimes there's a bit of a disconnect. Okay, uh, uh, there. Um, uh, sometimes you're absolutely right. It's it's the senior leaders who, um, you know, they're charged with delivering the strategy, and they believe that the best way of doing it is to put people through this kind of training, whatever whatever that is. Um, and that might be, but that might not be the kind of training that can stick. Or it may, maybe it's better done in a different modality. You know, one of the reasons why uh, why, why we created all these self paced courses is that is that not everybody does well, you know, uh, in a group. You know, and some people like the idea of going through workbooks and going through this and watching video, etc. It's different strokes for different folks. I think though that uh, we need to acknowledge, and and Rania, you sort of hinted at it in your question. We need to acknowledge that sometimes leaders are not connected with what their people need. And 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 therefore the problem isn't with with the with the people who are complaining, the problems with the leaders who are are not as connected. And we also have to acknowledge that sometimes uh the people who are going to training um are so disconnected from the strategy that they have no idea why the training is important. Why is it relevant to them? Why is it important that they actually understand this kind of stuff? What does it got to, to do with me? I've got objectives that I have to hit. And this seems like a waste of my time. If I spend my time doing this, I won't be able to do what they've tasked me to do. Right? And, and, and so that's also a bit of an issue, which speaks, by the way, to the question of, of how do we build a good culture? We, 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 we spoke on that in another of these Leadership Insights webinars and everything. Um, but I, I think that... Um, I gave the example earlier about, gee, you know, if we're coaching up here or we're doing a retreat up here and we're also doing the monthly thing, we hear things, it becomes just another mechanism of, of communication. You know? And I think that this is, a, this is a very um, exciting time because for organizations who say, yeah, we need everybody on the same page. Okay, we know that we've got great people here. We just need to make sure that there's new gas in the tank. Right and not subject them to the most boring, uh, okay, uh, um, um, training delivered in an incorrect, you know, modality that's not connected to all the other things we're doing in the organization, and and uh, where where it doesn't matter if if I sort of do stuff at the other at the same time uh, because there's no accountability afterwards. No, no, we can do better than that. So, I have a question, Randall. Um, you're a big supporter of appreciative inquiry, you know, focusing in on the good and doubling down on the good within an organization. Um, when it, when leadership is thinking about upskilling their team, you know, in a, in a world where we wish it could all be done, but they have to set priorities within their budget, would you advise that they double down and train more into their areas of expertise to hone that expertise or to look at those skill gaps and level up on the skill gaps? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um... What I would say is there has to be a bit of both, because at a certain point, the, the negatives, if you have the blockers, the, the, the lack of knowledge will, will increase risk for the organization and, and it'll reduce productivity and actually, actually make people frustrated as well. At a certain point, you've got to say, we got to deal with the negatives. I also say that if a particular organization has got a, 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 a strategic mandate, we are the organization that fills in the blank. We have a, 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 a purpose greater than just serving our members or, or selling stuff or whatever it happens to be. Um, you, ha you, you have to invest in that. And, and if you think, for example, that, that uh, uh, you're the expert in everything in that particular area, I'm talking about the functional skills and some of the leadership skills or management training, all that. If you know everything perfectly, you don't need to do training. You're already there. There's no doubling down necessary. But I haven't seen a single client in the 100 plus that, that we've helped, excuse me, not a single one who said, hmm, you know, the brain's full. Yeah, we, we can't learn anything else. Okay. And, and, and I guess if I ran across them, I'd probably say I'm not so sure, you know, we, we can help because I don't know if we can help. But I, 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 I do think that dividing it between how do we make sure that if we're really good, you know, life does not stand still. The people are only doing one of two things, only one of two things. They're learning or they're forgetting. That's it. 
So if you are really, really, really good at a particular thing as a management team, as individual contributors, as a leadership group, et cetera, as a board, okay, um, that's fine. Okay, but eventually what you'll know will go stale. They will, right? Or the business environment will change and what you knew and how to address that will not be as relevant, right? On the other hand, you know, um, do you want to get ahead of the curve or do you want to sort of, are you behind the eight ball and you need to catch up? That's where the blockers are. You know, if those things are, are, are becoming strategic, I think one of the other issues that we have not talked really so much, we, we just sort of brushed over it at the very beginning was, what's the impact of, unemp uh, of uh, on employee retention or employee engagement, right? Uh, if you've got a, a member serving organization and you want members to be engaged, how do you make sure that you're actually, you know, um, uh, making sure that your staff are, that your board are, that your volunteers are, right? So so there's a certain sort of uh, symmetry. We, we need to make sure that we're doing what we want the people out there. If you're very big on on, on, on client service, for example, if, if you're a, a corporate organization, it's the very same thing. How do you make sure that everybody else internally has got that kind of mindset as opposed to if that's what you expect from people outside? So engagement, retention, real important. I want to acknowledge that we're coming up on the hour. We're happy to stay on a bit longer for any more specific questions. And I want to thank everyone for, you know, whatever we had time for, for comments and questions. I have one uh, question I'd like to ask, and then we can wrap up with any uh, final thoughts. My question is, <clears throat> I'd like to address the little elephant in the Zoom event room. Um, we've hosted many webinars. And um, while it's true that leaders are busy and don't always have time to come live, they register just to get the recording link that we send to them. Um, while we do like uh, deliberately to keep these groups smaller, this has been the topic that generated the least interest. While we do know it is a topic that regularly comes up with clients and leaders about managing their people and their team and filling those gaps with any individual employee that's not perfect or teams that are imperfect. How, do, how would you explain do you have any thoughts on why the interest on the topic has been lower than any other topic that we've <clears throat> put out there? Um, yeah, I do actually, and and I'm saddened by it, but I could understand it. Okay, so if you're an executive director at a professional association, you're very concerned about, gee, is my business model broken? Gee, um, how do I make sure that I get that conference up? coming up because that's what we're doing. Gee, we've got, so we've got all these things. If you're on the corporate side, it, it's really the question of saying, well, in the olden days, learning development training was a function of the HR department and it was strategic to make sure everybody, and then all the cuts through the 80s, 90s, the, the 2000s, 2010s, et cetera, stripped so much of the training out of that. And so what ended up happening is functional heads, head of, head of, um, um, Sales, for example, or head of IT or whoever says, well, we're gonna, we need to do training for our people, so we'll just handle it over here. But those people didn't have overall responsibility for training and development. And 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 there's just really more focus on making sure the IT is secure or the systems are up or 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 we got to get those quotas done, et cetera, you know, um, made. So so all of a sudden it became kind of a bit of a tactical thing, right? And and so Anybody in HR, very sadly, a lot of their jobs in many organizations are very transactional. We got to make sure payroll systems work. Gee, we got to make sure the recruitment process works. Um, you know, and even though most CEOs will say the strength of our organization is in the people that we have, we we are very careful about hiring the best people. We want to make sure that they're they're doing the very best. We support them, et cetera, et cetera. But not everybody is as enlightened, perhaps, as they were at one point with respect to saying, this is the number one thing on my personal agenda as a leader for everybody else. So they don't have a problem spending money for coaching for themselves. We, we, we coach quite a few CEOs. But on the other hand, um, for everybody else, it's a less on their personal priority. There is no head of HR in many organizations that says, this is what we, we, we're going to be doing uh, for our staff. Um, and, and I, I think that's how I rationalize, rationalize it. Now for anyone listening and everything, um, I, I sure hope that, that, uh, uh, that in, in your particular organization, um, it's a little bit more enlightened and perhaps that's why you might be, you know, listening to the recording. Um, but I also think that it's a bit of a, 
a challenge. How do we make sure that when we say people are, are truly our strength, how do we make sure that there's, there's a seat at the leadership table to say, okay, now what does that mean? And how do we make sure that we keep the best that we bring everyone uh, you know, along for the journey, that, that we bring these new ideas in. And that's actually part of a strategic uh, foundation for actually getting people to do stuff and do stuff efficiently and do stuff in a, and, and you know, innovate and be creative and, and be productive and all those other things. So. so Randall, to bring us home to uh, final thoughts, the question that I would pose is, you know, when we think of, you know, our uh, nutrition and our diet, we have to have our proteins and our, you know, different uh, carbs, you know, while, while we know working with organizations is that everyone is unique and their needs are different and those needs change, is there a way, you know, is, is it true, is it true that providing training is wrapped into the cost of doing business? And just like you can't say, sorry, we can't, you know, pay rent or pay salaries, is, is there like a baseline of team investment that we can like what's you always say what's che cheap and cheerful like what are the those core there's, blocks that need to be part of the professional development of a team so i i my my my, my god you know that is such a great question and and the reason why is is because um well i'll point out a couple of things number one the question of how do you when you promote somebody the best fill in the blank becomes the manager of such and such um, when that happens, we lose the best, whatever they're doing. And uh, sometimes we gain somebody who's not spent their entire career managing or being a director, VP, whatever the level is. So I, I think there's a place that, that must happen to, to upskill people, both in terms of, you know, building business acumen, but also the functional knowledge of being a manager. So I think there's that, that's one part of it. There's another part of, of training where you, you kill two birds with one stone. Uh, I don't think, you know, the one bird, one stone sort of rationale kind of works anymore. Like, you know, after all, we're talking about ROI of training. And that's the question of delivering a functional skill to a group of people while using that as the vector to getting the group of people to work better together, okay, to, to build the teamwork, okay, but to actually have some sort of output that actually makes a bit of a difference in terms of the training outcomes, I should say. So so I think that's that, that's the second thing. I think the third thing, which which, you know, sometimes isn't looked at through this lens, it is is the the leadership or board retreat, right? And sometimes it's like, okay, well, we're going to get together, and depending on the organization, it's still this wonderful place, okay, wherever it is, and it's a million fun activities which are designed to build relationships. Very very important, but I think there there could be a little bit more time spent on on the retreat design, okay, and thinking about about sort of how what happens at the retreat and the messages that are are, are learned through there also are integrated with all the other training and 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 um, and uh, management modalities if you will whether it be mentorship or direct uh, you know you know performance appraisal or whether it be you know um, external training how do you how do you make sure that, that that is is built in because you spend so much money with your most senior people whether it's the board or senior leadership team doing that retreat whether it's one day or three days um, we need to make sure that everything that's learned there not just the outcome of the actual event that gets you know emailed to everybody or, or or sent about. We need to make sure that's embedded in every training in, investment that you make. Otherwise, you're missing a huge opportunity. And and I, I think it really is an opportunity. You're spending the money on the retreat anyway. Let's make sure that 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 everybody gets the benefit of some of the stuff that comes out of there. Not just the official outcome uh, output, I should say, but also that. Uh, um, the 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 cultural output, okay, the directional, the foundational, the uh, the strategic output, and that can't just be something that is broadcast from below. I I truly believe that it's got to be something that's embedded. Um, whenever anybody's got some of the um, um, some sort of learning and development activity, right? It, it, otherwise, you know, just having a document sent to everybody, it's it's not going to embed it. Right or getting the philosophy, it just won't be embedded. This is a way to make it happen. Yeah, well said. Um, we'll, we'll we'll cut the recording now, but we're happy to stay on the call to chat. Uh, so I'll just stop it. Thanks so much for for the hour, Randall and everybody.